The post all-star break schedule officially starts tonight when the Charlotte Hornets take on the Utah Jazz. Let's just bring it back to the basics. Why are the Hornets playing so much better post trade deadline? We'll get into that today. Locked on Hornets. You are locked on Hornets, your daily Charlotte Hornets podcast, part of the locked on podcast network, your team every day. Uh, in a minute, cause we live. We live. We live. <laughs> it's locked on Hornets, part of the locked on podcast network. It's your team every day. Thanks for making us your first listen. We are free and available anywhere you get your podcast. And that includes YouTube. This episode is is brought to you by LinkedIn. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NBA. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NBA to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. There's Doug Branson. You can find him and his work on his sub stack, every Hornets box score.com. And I'm Walker mail. You can listen to me every weekday on sports radio, 92, seven WFNZ on Wesson Walker. Again, 92, seven FM Doug has the post all-star break clean shaven mustache. It feels like that's the, it always weirds me out, always weirds me out, but it's here. Doug is ready to go. And so are the Charlotte Hornets. We'll and see. I, I, I hope so. You're right about that. So I joined Ovius and Gilio on YouTube yesterday. And they What does that mean? What is it? What is an Ovius and what is a Gilio? <laughs> I don't know what any of that means. If you know, Triad Area, Raleigh Legends, Joe wow. Ovius, Joe Gilio, they have their own YouTube channel, podcast series, and people are asking them to talk about the Charlotte Hornets, Doug. Like the, these guys out in Raleigh, no, we don't talk the Charlotte Hornets. We talk the Canes. That's that's our thing. Plus triad basketball. But people were asking them to talk about the Hornets, which is great because people care. It's nice to know that people care, and it's because of this three game winning streak. They asked me to explain Hornets basketball to them like they're five, and so it seems like you and I were both on the same same wavelength. Like, hey, let's just bring people back up to speed. Why were the Hornets so bad pre trade deadline? Why are they much better? Why are they winning three games in a row and looking to extend that winning streak once they get back from all-star break? And so let's just start right there, Doug. Why were the Hornets so bad before they got uh, these new players in the trade deadline, you know, revamping their bench by trading PJ and trading Gordon Hayward away? It's difficult to remember, uh, but at the beginning of this season, the Hornets were much healthier than they've been in quite a long time. I mean, other than losing Frank Nielakina to that tibia injury in the preseason, the Hornets were coming into this thing with an opportunity to showcase uh, the roster that Mitch Kupchak had built and that Steve Clifford did not have an opportunity last season uh, to really get into any kind of groove with. So there was a lot of promise to open the season, but injuries... Uh, mounted pretty quickly off of that with LaMelo Ball missing some time, Gordon Hayward missing time, uh, and and even Terry Rozier missing a few games too. Nick Richards, that concussion injury uh, that kept him out. And then, of course, Mark Williams, the lower back contusion that would take him out of the past few months. So it was just one after another. It was one in, one out, or sometimes one in and two out. Like They just couldn't keep enough players on the floor, like legitimate rotation players. You stack that on top of the fact that, that the Hornets did not address, I think, certain depth needs. You know, you think coming off of a season like last season where you were just mortally wounded most nights that you went out there, you would think that an organization would look at that and go, hey, if we really are serious about making a playoff run or a play-in run, we need to make sure that our depth is taken care of just in case we have a couple of more injuries this season. Well, they did. They had more than a couple, but they didn't address depth needs at the center position or the point guard position, and they let Dennis Smith Jr. walk to to go to the Nets. They let Kelly Oubre walk, and they didn't really replace some of those things and certainly didn't address the depth of the center position. And all of that stuff just continued to bite them over and over. Uh, and, And I think on top of that, so we stack that on top of that, on top of the fact that I don't think at its core this team was ever really built to be a serious playing contender in terms of the physicality, in terms of the mentality, in terms of the veteran leadership that is required to really you know, you know do the things in the regular season that need to happen that that get you to the play in it, it, yeah I, so i put out a joke i put out one of these gifs of hmm you know what 
that seems like a good idea when the, with the caption of, Hey, maybe Gabe Plotkin and Rick Schnall pitched to Mitch. What if we got real NBA players, put them on the bench and went at it that way? It's like, Hey, you know what? That is a pretty good idea. Like, Hey, well, let's try it. We'll see. Typically works. It's not the fairest of jokes, but I only use Twitter for jokes. And so I pressed send and got a few likes and made me happy for a little bit. So that's what I decided to roll with. But as Michael pointed out, who is a a P1, we appreciate the hell out of Michael. He said, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's like they they did have at least they anticipated PJ coming off of the bench and they were going to have more health. And that's all true. They were still probably a little off base with what they thought their ceiling was. But yes, health clearly contributed. And so with that, Doug, I want to compare box scores. Let's go back to Minnesota, the game they won. And the reason I choose Minnesota is because that also coincided with the last game that Terry Rozier played with this team. So Mm -hmm. that is the most like what we thought we were going to get this season with even normal injury luck. Here was the box score. The people that came off of the bench in that one. You ready? Yeah. Leaky Black played five minutes. JT Thor played 16. Nathan Mensa played 15. Ish Smith played 11. Bryce McGowan's played six. Nick Smith Jr. played 15. Frank Nilakina, James Booknight didn't play DNPCD. That was your bench. Let's go to the very first bench lineup they have once yeah. these guys are available to play after the trade deadline. The bench against the Memphis Grizzlies. The guys coming off of the pine, Grant Williams, Davies Bertans, Seth Curry, uh, Seth Curry, and Vasilya Micic. Literally zero people were the same. Mm-hmm. No people that were the same. And in fact, the DNP CDs for that game against Minnesota, they're off the team now. They got cut. <laughs> so yep. that's how it worked. You bring in new bench players. Now they're playing. They're the guys getting run. The guys that were getting run now get shifted to Greensboro or they just don't play in your break glass in case of emergency. And the guys that weren't playing then, they're now off of the team. It's much more logical when you think about it that way. So what happened was injury luck after we thought it couldn't get any worse. Well, you know what? It at least stayed the same. Injury luck stayed the same from last year. And the bench players that they had to call on weren't ready to go. And that's not their fault. But goodness gracious, man, late first round picks, undrafted. Like you had two guys that were young and undrafted. And then you go to the complete opposite end of the spectrum and you go get a Smith who was retired. Talked about how he wanted to hit the links. He was almost, no, he said he was almost retired. He was on like, he was, he was R E T I and he was about to fill out the rest of the word. And they called. That's right. That's right. Which is how you, listen, that's how you build a play in team. (laughs) You go out and get the guy who is seconds away from hanging it up. And that's, and I'm not even, I thought a Smith in in the minutes could. that he had played well played hard Did what but he could. i mean can't shoot a 3 you know that's been the big the biggest difference like if you look at the stats over the last 3 games that they've won uh where i think in net rating they are second in the nba in in the last 3 games and, and so much of that is three point shooting they are taking more threes they are making more threes like they're passing the ball much better but their assist percentage is has not skyrocketed compared to what it was they're just they're hitting more threes they're playing more defense they're playing harder they're getting back on defense and i think that is about having a veteran bench but i also think it is about something that's a little bit more ephemeral something you can't touch something that is a little bit intangible. And that is, I just think that shaking up the roster like that reset the belief. I feel like with like head coaches and core groups of NBA players, you get at maximum four years. And if you don't have some kind of playoff success in that four years, and really, I mean, most it's like two or three, but by four, you got to just reset, whether it's head coach or roster or both you got to reset because guys lose belief. Even if even if we can all say, well, look at the injuries. I mean, you can't expect that team to win whatever core with the injuries. Doesn't matter. Guys can't envision the team winning anymore, and you've got to reset it, and I think that's that's part of this too. It was so different from the personality coming into the season, like in training camp. Guys were ready to go. They really thought they had something, and then it just completely went away. The injuries, I think, set that in. And so, and perhaps, and I I know you're saying both points are right. What, What probably happened 
was all of the injuries took place. They got off to a bad, not, not a bad start. I shouldn't say that, but they got off to a start where LaMelo wasn't hitting shots nearly as much. And then he turned into an all NBA kind of guy, the way that he was playing. But yeah. once they started to suffer the injuries and they started to lose and lose and lose, it felt like, okay, we're just not going to be able to get out of this. And that's when you really started to take all of the other things into consideration. I'm ready to change this up because you, you think that that's when people are the most vulnerable, right? It's when you have this expectation that is so the exact opposite of what actually happens that you're so defeated. You're just done and you can't get out of bed to go play basketball. Like it's just not even, Oh, tip off. All right. You know, I expect we'll, we'll compete in the first half, but we're not going to win this game. So I think you're right. Once the injuries took place, I think that's when you started to have some of those feelings of just not being able to get that win against any of these teams. Let's continue to talk about why the team is better coming up next on the lockdown Hornets podcast. Don't go to sleep on the Hornets just yet. We'll get through some of the other reasons why they've won three straight. What exactly happened at the deadline for them to have won three straight? And then Doug wants to pitch a new game for all of us a little bit later on in the show. Stick around and find out what's to come on Locked on Hornets. Before we embark on all of the fun, I did want to tell you about LinkedIn jobs. When you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. That's why this episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn jobs because they have the tools to help find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. LinkedIn isn't just another job board. LinkedIn has a vast network of more than a billion professionals, which makes it the best place to hire. It gives you access to professionals you can't find anywhere else. LinkedIn does all that while making the process easy and intuitive. Hiring is easy when you have that many quality candidates. So easy, in fact, that 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. That's it. It doesn't take very long. LinkedIn knows that small businesses are wearing so many hats and might not have the time or resources to hire. LinkedIn is constantly finding ways to make the process easier. They even just launched a feature that helps you write job descriptions, making the process even easier and quicker. Couldn't get any easier. Two and a half uh, million small businesses use LinkedIn for hiring. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NBA. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NBA to post your job for free terms and conditions apply more locked on Hornets ahead. And the theme of explaining the Hornets to people like they're five years old, just catching people up. It's been a little bit of a break yep. here with All-Star Weekend. Their minds have been on fixing the All-Star game while the Hornets, they were fixed at the deadline. And so we're telling people why. The revamped bench, just getting real NBA players and having those guys suit up every single night. That's been a big old help, but also Brandon Miller continuing to shine. That'll help you too. Doug, it, what's amazing to me about Brandon is that it does not matter what role you've asked of him at such a young age. He's been pretty damn good at it. It doesn't matter at the beginning of the season. He's playing so much off ball because, of course, it's LaMelo Ball. He's the point guard. And we expect that to happen again. The injury report released yesterday does say that LaMelo and Mark are just out. We knew that was going to happen with Mark. LaMelo, I thought, all right, maybe doubtful, questionable designation. So we'll see how much longer that continues. But well, Rod Boone, Rod Boone did report, Charlotte Observer did report that he's doing more and more. It just seems like we're getting very, right. very close to seeing LaMelo ball back on the floor. It's just not going to happen against Utah. Well, and, and, they, and they, we, they do have like a two game roadie here, and he is on the road with them. So that should tell you, you know. If he's going on the road, if he's going out west, that should tell you he's he's pretty close. No, and we knew that even before the All Star break because Steve yeah. Clifford said the same thing. Just I, you know, he's out. Usually, I'd like to see questionable, and then we're ready to go. But we'll see, we'll see. So Lamella, when he does come back, Brandon Miller clearly isn't going to be handling the ball as much. But that's already happening in the first two games that you had once the guys returned from the deadline, and he's only putting up single digit shot attempts and he's still being an effective player. He's been amazing. And so in case you missed it here, Doug, Brandon Miller has been fantastic this entire season and it's by far been the brightest spot, even despite this three game winning streak. Uh, he is the real deal for sure. Um, his, his growth in his, in his game is accelerating faster than even the people that wanted the Hornets to draft him. I think he's growing faster than even they anticipated. He's like one of these, 
AI chat GPT kind of things where it just happens. You're like, wait, a year ago, it was this weird video of Will Smith eating spaghetti that looked odd. And now you look at the videos that these AI things can create now. And it's it's amazing the progress and how quickly it's happening. It's scary. And it is scary to see how close Brandon is to to fully realizing that sort of all NBA super wing that we were talking about, like, that's his top, top ceiling, right? Jason Tatum. He's certainly not Jason Tatum right now, mm-hmm. but you, we've seen so many flashes of a guy that can handle the ball, that can move defenses, that can catch and shoot, that can get his own shot, his mid-range game that he didn't get to showcase in Alabama. It is fully there. He can get to his spot. He can create for others, although – I think that's something that he's done less of because the bench was so bad that they really depended on Miles Bridges and Brandon Miller to create so much of the offense that it's been more about them finding their own shots than about creating for others. That's kind of why I'm a little bit excited about him with this new bench and getting LaMelo back is that maybe in the back half in these final 28, we see Brandon Miller do a little bit more creating for others because it's got to all come together. All facets of his game have to come together if he's going to sort of reach that upper echelon of the NBA, which I think is definitely within reach now. Well, and and plus now that you have so many just competent basketball bodies on the floor, yeah. like I I'm I'm excited about different lineups that you can roll with with Lamelo and Brandon on the floor, and so you know Trey Mann, Lamelo Ball, Brandon Miller, all out there on the floor. That's a lot of attacking. You have shooting. It doesn't matter who ha- who's handling the basketball, and somebody can get open for a cut or a drive even just an open shot on a relocation, like that's going to be a lot of fun. Even Michich, you know, yeah. Michich just finding Mello and Brandon. I don't, I don't know, you know, how much you would roll with that because defensively there's maybe some stuff to be desired, but like you can have some fun with some of these lineups that Steve Clifford yeah. wasn't able to do before the deadline. Yeah. Offensively, this team is transformed. Right. Like you really have to look at only the past three games to get any kind of idea of what you're up against, against the Charlotte Hornets, because offensively, they look so different. They are driving, they are kicking, they are moving defenses, and that's and that's what happens when you have guys like Micic on the floor or Curry on the floor uh, or Trey Mann on the floor who can do that. And then on top of that, you've got Grant Williams who can knock down threes. You've got Davis Bertans who is running the floor and can pull up and hit a tough three. And so, yeah, there's more space out on the floor for Miles Bridges to drive. There's more space on the floor for uh, Brandon Miller to get open in the corner on the wing. And so, yeah, it's it's been incredible to see this team, uh, you know, really transform offensively and and be a scoring, attacking team that they haven't been all season long. Um, you want to get to your sicko satchel yeah. question before we move on? All right, you are the keeper of the sicko satchel, but I'll ask you because I know you're the one that wants to talk about three point shooting. You mentioned it in the first segment and how much of a factor that's been for the Hornets offensively. The sicko satchel question for you, Doug. Could you elaborate on the importance of having a three point shooting big in today's NBA on a future podcast? I always hear you mention it, but I'd love to know what you expect that to bring to this roster slash offense. Doug, explain yourself. Yeah, this question comes to us. We we don't like to play favorites, but this is one of our favorite sickos. This is uh, Rod Morrow, who's been on the show, Rodimus Prime. Uh, Follow him on Twitter. Uh, So, yeah, he hit me up and asked me to elaborate because we were talking about um, the the newest addition, Marquise Bolden, to the to the lineup. And, And I said, hey, this is a this is a big that can shoot. And what I really meant, because, yes, technically, Grant Williams is a big, you know, he can shoot. Um, fine, but what I really meant was a center. They they have not had a center that can shoot. I, I thought Nick Richards was hiding it under a bushel. I'm skeptical at this point. That he's, he's still hiding, hiding it. it. I mean, Maybe. the thing is, well, we he's don't doing even a great really job. Know. I'll like, say yeah. that he's doing one of the best hiding <laughs> jobs I've ever seen. Uh, Mark Williams, we haven't had we haven't even had an opportunity for him to hit that over on ten three point attempts right. uh, because he hasn't been on the floor for ten games lately. So. Uh, We haven't seen that. So why is it important to go five out? Well, so many teams are doing it, and it's because you need to have five guys that are a threat to shoot. It's not really about like a Bolden or Mark Williams or Nick Richards putting up five or six three point attempts a game. It's about being them a threat being a threat to shoot it because that spreads defenses out as thin as possible. It means that a team defensively against you cannot like auto drop 
on that one five pick and roll. And what, because when they do that, they're going to clog the lane. It's going to make it more difficult for Brandon Miller to drive and get to that mid range spot. It's going to make it more difficult for LaMelo to, to get in there and, and cause havoc underneath because it's just more bodies that can drop when you're in that one five pick and roll situation. It opens up more angles for drive and kick. It provides like a pick and pop outlet to counter, you know, teams blitzing LaMelo or blitzing Brandon, those double teams. You can punish those if you have a five that can shoot it and and it's like a cheat code in transition when you're running and that five can run with you and set a quick pick and then pop i mean teams exploit that all the time just look across the board your teams that win in the playoffs and win championships most of them not all but most of them roll with at least one big or one center that can shoot it there's a reason because that's where the nba is moving to you've got to get five out eventually and so that's why it's exciting whether it's bolden or or any big that they bring in in the future any center that they bring in that shoots that's only going to make this team more deadly yeah and even for me where i i I don't even dispute the importance of it i would love to have it right it would be a luxury at this point because the hornets haven't had it i i just Man, I would like to for even Mark Williams to explore more of the mid-range shooting just to even be a threat there. And that hasn't happened. But that's the most frustrating part. We don't know if Mark Williams can shoot the three. Steve Clifford has talked about it. He's worked on it. We talked about it this offseason. That's where you get the over under 10 mark from because I asked Mark that and he said, I don't know, I think the over, but we'll have to see. Like he thought he would shoot a couple of open looks and zero. He's not even shooting mid-range jumpers. And we can go back to that Phoenix game two years ago, I guess, at this point, where he hit a couple. And we know that he's got a good free throw mark. He's got a good touch. Like, I I just would like the pick and pops even from 15 feet out. And I know I'm I'm asking for more mid-range jumpers in the day and age where that's supposed to be the worst shot in the world. But I'm not asking for you to attempt five a game, just like one or two, just so you have another option rather than just doing the, you know, the role and then he gets bumped off of his spot and then maybe you just kill a possession because he's not physical enough to get to the rim. Like I just, can we extend it out 15 feet and then maybe we can explore extending it out to the three point line with Mark, but you're right. It would be nice to have somebody that's what six ten or above that can shoot that three because that's what you really want. That's what you're talking about, right? When you talk about the big that can shoot Grant Williams on cleaning the glass is considered a big PJ Washington on cleaning the glass is considered a big, but those guys aren't 6'10". Those guys aren't protecting the rim nearly as Mm -hmm. much as some of these other centers can. That's it. When you can have both, when you can have both, that's what's really hard to navigate through as an offense and just as a team in general because they bring you a threat from the outside offensively and inside defensively. Right. The Hornets can go five out right now with Gray Williams, and they could have before with P.J. Washington. The problem with P.J. Washington is that, like, statistically, they were just getting hammered defensively when P.J. Washington was at the center position. And so, Grant Williams, you're a little bit better in that respect and and rebounding as well. But at the same time, when you're talking – I just I have to separate these conversations between what happens in the regular season and what happens in the playoffs. Oh, very Steve you Clifford, try to roll, we're learning. We're learning from Cliff. This is what we have to you do. You learn by watching the games. If you watch the playoffs, like those small lineups, if you play those extended periods, the the other the the opposing team is going to pick up on that and punish you for that. You've got to be able to go five out with with size. You've got to be able to go five out with somebody that can defend the rim. Uh, because otherwise, the t- it's a chess match, and the team is going to be eas- easily able to checkmate you if you're not if you can't do that. And that's why the teams that win in the playoffs typically can go five out and protect the rim. You made the you made the point there. That's what you got to do both. Let's move on. Play some bingo, shall we? Coming up next on the Locked On Hornets podcast. Don't go to sleep on the Hornets just yet. So coming up next, we're going to play bingo. I-, I thought this was Doug, but apparently he can't take credit for this. I thought he might but he can't take credit for it. In fact, it's a sicko that pitched this and needs our help playing bingo. So we help with bingo coming up next on Lockdown Hornets. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel. The wait is almost over, North Carolina. FanDuel, America's number one sports book, is coming to your state. It's coming to our state. 
On March 11th, you'll finally be able to bet on all of your favorite teams in all of your favorite sports. With FanDuel, there's tons of ways for you to get in on the action. You can bet on everything from the money line to over-unders to which team will win this year's Tobacco Road Rivalry all on an app that's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Plus, with live betting, you can even pick which player will put up the next bucket and the one after that. See for yourself why FanDuel is America's number one sports book. Just go to FanDuel.com slash locked on so you can be the first to know when FanDuel goes live in North Carolina. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel, 21 plus and present in North Carolina. If gambling is more than a game for you or a loved one, free help is available. Text more than a game to 53342, or you can call 877-718-5543 or visit more than a game dot NC dot gov. More locked on Hornets ahead. To keep up with the FanDuel theme, FanDuel Vegas. Not catching up with what the Hornets are doing here, Doug. Sleeping on. I thought All-Star break might do it. Thought there was enough time for them to readjust, but it feels like they think that three-game winning streak was an outlier. Hornets a 10-point dog tonight. On the road. On the road against Utah. West Coast roadie. Right out of the gate. Got a few uh, road games before you come back to the Spectrum Center. So it's not crazy. It's not nuts. But it's not like the Jazz are great either, especially with how they operated at the deadline, trading Olenek for a first-round pick, so getting worse, trading enough of an asset to warrant a first-round pick. And Hornets are still a 10-point dog, Doug. It just feels like they're not not, um, privy to what the Hornets have been doing here recently. And the line's moving. It was nine and a half. Now it's 10, an extra half point for Utah. I don't know what they're doing. I mean, the Jazz, they seem like they're sellers. They seem like they wanted to get worse at the deadline. And and Vegas is sleeping on them right now. And hopefully they don't. I think it would be a gigantic sign of maturity if the Hornets did not have a letdown tonight. Mm -hmm. You're going out west, you know, playing at home in Utah after the break. Everybody's probably trying to get their legs back. You know, maybe that's maybe that's all factoring into it. But the Hornets are a vastly different team. And tonight, if they were able to, you know, fight all of that off, then I think it would show th- that the hope is real. Because right now there's a lot of hope. But they've got to win. We did the math. Like, I mean, conservatively, they've got to win 20 out of the next 28. And they probably need to win more. Right. So, I mean, that's that's a difficult road. Uh, it seems almost impossible, although they've done it before. 13-14 Bobcats game, won, uh, that team won 20 of their last 28. So it's been mm-hmm. done before, but that's a tough road to hoe, but it's got to start in Utah. Can't have a letdown. All right, so how do we help this person with bingo, Doug? What do we need to do? Explain yourself. All right, so um, one of the uh, Sicko Brigade members on Subtext, join subtext.com forward slash locked on Hornets, texted me and said, hey, Doug, I'll be at the Utah game on Thursday with some other Charlotteans that got stuck out west. To add to the fun, I'm making bingo cards with Hornets-specific squares like Very cool. Brandon Miller chase down block or someone turns an ankle. Ouch. Oh, no. <laughs> I mean, fair. I, uh, fair. Yeah. <laughs> But ouch. <laughs> no, don't. I hope he doesn't have to cross that one off. That's going to be the saddest cross off ever. Oh, I mean, for the Hornets, it should be the center square, right? It should just be the one that take is your automatic. Free space. Yeah, <laughs> just take your free space. Not anymore, though. They're new. It's a new look Hornets. So that that's that's pre-trade deadline bingo that's card. Right. Yeah, it's not post-trade deadline bingo card. That's right. So they want suggestions from you and I on, on fun bingo squares to add. And by the way, I love this idea. I'm part of a supporters Great group, idea. Mixtape 615 here in Nashville for Nashville's MLS team, the soccer team, uh, Nashville SC. And they do this at the away match get-togethers. They'll hand out bingo cards and you buy them and you get prizes it's a cool thing so i encourage this activity and i've got a few suggestions here Walker. well and i might steal this by the way like the just we just had a we had a programming meeting yesterday just just i had one with my producer on wes and walker like trying to figure out how to make things interesting during an off season where the panthers don't have a first round pick and so here we are talking about the Hornets. We're talking about college basketball, but football is going to be tough. And so maybe bingo is the way to spice it up. And so I appreciate your help. I will be stealing that content. Thank you, sir. But I will also be shouting you out. I will not uh, leave you without credit. Okay, here's my first suggestion. We've waited long enough. Now, you're in Utah, so my first suggestion for a square is more man. You get it? More man. And I wish, you hit, I wish I did. 
<laughs> you hit this square by Trey Mann playing 31 or more minutes. Because right now, over those three games, he's averaging 30.3. So if he beats that and has 31 or more minutes, just, just that's now more man. Just just now clicked. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. It's hard, hard emphasis on the man. And so it, it took me away from oh, where sorry. you wanted more, me to go. More man. Mormon. More man. More, more man. man. More, more man. man. Okay. I like it. <laughs> uh, all right. I'm going to do another one and then I'm going to toss it to you. This one's okay. called Nick set a bleeping screen. Everybody, uh, maybe, maybe folks that are just joining don't remember this, but earlier in the year when Nick Richards was getting some big starting minutes, uh, you know, you're hardest on the ones you love the most. And the cameras caught Steve Clifford screaming at Nick Richards mm-hmm. to set a bleeping screen. So you fill this square in if Clifford rages at one of his own players. There you go. You okay. got one? I do. The the one that comes to mind is if you'll remember, there was a Utah fan here at the Spectrum Center that would not stop whistling <laughs> and was making these weird noises. Bird so, calls. So I have one called Whistle While You Watch. If you hear that guy, you get to cross off a box on your bingo card. Because that guy was as annoying as any fan that I can remember just from my couch. Like I wouldn't even at the Spectrum Center. Dell and Eric also made that call. And so whistle while you watch. I think that's one that should be up there because you're going to be in Utah. Well, if if you don't mind, I'd like to punch that up a little bit because I think you should cross that square off if you dare to do that during a Utah sure. free throw. If you return the favor, I don't know how close yeah. you're sitting, but if you can return the favor and, and we can hear you on the broadcast – cross that square off that would be great I, honestly please do it that that's a lot to ask i'm asking you to be the very person that i destroyed when we talked about this i love that person i i hate i couldn't stand it. couldn't stand it and it's up so to I'm utah to utah person. fans it, it's up to them to drown that person out and and that's why that you could hear that person because mm-hmm. charlotte that was pre-deadline charlotte was not excited they were not chanting go hornets in the arena it's up to utah fans to drown to drown uh, my friend here the sicko out all right um i've got another one for you back to the future this is if seth curry who is now donning the 30 uh for in in honor well he was always donning the 30 but he's donning the 30 now in in purple and teal just like his father del curry if seth curry hits multiple threes in the game that's back to the future okay I like that one. The only other one I have is uh, the the Michich wow moment or Vasil yes Michich if you will Euro step. <laughs> Maybe we go Euro step um, if we just have a crazy play. Whatever is the play that gets the oohs and ahs from an away crowd where they're not going to cheer for you, but it's enough to be like, whoa, okay, that was awesome. Can you get something like that from Michich in this game? Then you can cross that off of your bingo card, and odds are you'll be able to do so. And he has had them. He has had them so far. Secret weapon. These over the head passes, the fake passes, uh, the fake shots to get mm-hmm. guys up in the air. I mean, he's he's got it, man. Euro League MVP was buried on that OKC bench. I think the Hornets stole, absolutely stole him from OKC. Stole him. Um, I've got one for Michich, too. Actually, I've got three, if you want, three blocks here. One's called Michich. Very simple. That's Michich scores unassisted. Mm-hmm. That's Michich. Michich. Uchich would be a block where Michich assists another Hornet. And then we all chitch. That's someone assists Michich on a bucket. So okay. if someone gives him a pass and he scores. So that's Michich, Uchich. We all chitch. A couple more. That dog in him is if Brandon Miller gets mad at his own team, which he's done multiple times this season, the rookie being the leader, stepping up, getting mad at them, not getting back on transition defense. If you catch that, then you can cross that one off. And then finally, here's my final one. One, two, three level score. That's if Brandon Miller scores a layup and a mid-range shot Mm -hmm. and a three. It's, It's his version of hitting for the cycle. That's a one, two, three level score. That's Brandon Miller. I like all those. I don't have any more to contribute, but I like every single one of those. Bingo! So, yep. Nice job helping out with bingo. It's a great idea. One that I plan to steal. And so I appreciate <laughs> that idea. Thank you for bringing that to Locked On Hornets. And thank you for coming to Locked On Hornets and making us your first listen. Now make your second listen. Locked On NBA. And make sure you go to Locked On Sports today. Live on YouTube, Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. Locked On Sports today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On Plus, our national shows uh, covering every single league. 
Go to Locked On Sports today on YouTube and subscribe to the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel. Have a great rest of your day. We'll be back with you tomorrow. In the meantime, make sure you go check out everyhornetsboxscore.com to check out the write-up on this Jazz game tonight. And then you can listen to us on WFNZ, me and Wes Bryant, 12 to 3 p.m., 92.7 FM. We'll be back with you tomorrow to recap the Jazz game. Bingo! 